Easter is almost here, and we are excited to share our plans with you today. This will be a weekend of worship meant to help you and your family center your hearts and minds as we reflect on the cross and the light of the resurrection. First, we will have three Good Friday services on March 29th at 4.30, 5.45, and 7 p.m. These services will be focused on Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross and will consist of prayer, communion, meditation, and worship. We'll have childcare available during all three services for infant through kindergarten age. Immediately following those services, we will begin a 24-hour prayer gathering in the Family Life Center. Our leadership team is committed to be praying from 8 p.m. on Good Friday to 8 p.m. on Saturday. You can come and go at any time to pray, worship, and meditate. You can come by yourself, or this could be a great experience to share with your family, friends, or life group. No matter what you choose, our hope is that we will be a church that's united in prayer as we anticipate Jesus' resurrection, not just on Easter morning, but in every area of our lives. Finally, we will gather together to celebrate on Easter morning during our four Sunday services at 7, 8.30, 10, and 11.30 a.m. Kids programming will offer an Easter party for infant through fifth grade during the 8.30 and 11.30 a.m. services. We anticipate our Easter services will be completely full. And we want to welcome new guests into our church and make it easy for them to get connected and show them extraordinary hospitality. One practical way to help with that is by creating space for them in the parking lot and the auditorium. Parking will be available across the street at Boone Hospital and shuttle services will bring you directly to the church building. Additionally, we believe that the 8.30 and 10 a.m. services will be the fullest. And so we invite you to please consider attending either the 7 or 11.30 a.m. services. We know that not everyone can make a schedule change and many of you have serving commitments, but if you're able to adjust your routine to make room for others to hear the good news of Jesus, we believe that it will make a great difference. There are a lot of details surrounding Easter, so scan the QR code or visit Easter at forum.org for more information. You can also share the link with a friend or pick up invite cards on your way out this morning. We're excited to celebrate with you very soon. Well, good morning, everyone. You know, to those of you who are new or visiting with us, we just want to extend a warm welcome to you. We're really glad that you're here with us. And we invite you all to stand with us if you're able as we prepare our hearts and our minds and our bodies to encounter the Lord, to be changed by Him, and to praise Him through song. And so we're going to read together as a way to help prepare us from 1 Chronicles 16. So as, these, as the scripture appears on the screen, I invite you to read out loud the parts that are in yellow, labeled all. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim His name, and we all say, make no Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts. Sing to the Lord all the earth, proclaim his salvation day after day. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. So let's do that now in this moment. Let's come to him and let's bring an offering, a sacrifice of praise. Come, let us worship our king. Let us bow at his feet because he, he has done great things. He alone is worthy of our praise. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Oh, He has done great things. Let's sing together. Oh, here of heaven.
So I think the word unexpected to me means something that you didn't see coming, probably didn't even anticipate was even a possibility. My cancer began in uh, about mid uh, 2014 and a doctor that I was seeing saw a spot on my back and sent it off to the lab to be analyzed. Came back that I had stage four metastatic melanoma, meaning that it was in multiple places in my body, in my lymph nodes and uh, in my lungs were the two main places. At nighttime, when I was doing my prayers to the Lord, he just kept laying on me, James 5, 14 through 15. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith 
will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. So just night after night, as I had these truly gut-wrenching prayers with the Lord, and I never recall praying to heal me, I just prayed, increase my faith in that, Lord. Help me to truly believe that you are the same today, yesterday, and will be tomorrow. And he just says, Dave, you've done all the things right that make sense in this world. But trust me and believe in me. So I did what James 5, 14 through 15 said. I called Scott Sutherland, who was our pastor at the time, and he called together the elders of the church and prayed over me. And I just can't express what a spiritual moment that was for my wife and I. Following Monday, my wife and Dr. Moscato had a conversation, at which time Dr. Moscato told her that I had one to two months to live. Within 10 days of that anointing, Penny and I were sitting on the couch and one of the lymph nodes was on the back of my neck here that was inflamed and bulging. And I just turned her and I said, I think it's getting smaller. She rubbed it and said, mm, you know, maybe or whatever, but not sure. But that weekend when we were in church, that Sunday had her arm around me and was just kind of rubbing the back of my neck. And she just looked at me and said, oh my gosh, I think it's gone. Just over the course of the next say month or so the spots began to disappear in my lymph nodes and their cancer began to disappear in my lungs and in mid-january just you know a few weeks before i couldn't say a sentence without having to catch my breath because my lungs were so full i was having trouble with my back intense coughing that i was doing and four to six weeks later you know i'm outside you know, painting our house. I'm gonna be honest, I fully expected to be cured because I was to the point where I fully believed in him. So that was not a surprise or unexpected to me. Things that maybe were a surprise to me were the level of intimacy I felt with the Lord at that time, especially praying to him and that it just seemed like he was so close and he was talking directly to me. Yes, to celebrate that. Oh, we get to celebrate the unexpected. Like, God is still at work today. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Isn't that right? Yes. He's still doing amazing things. He's still doing unexpected things in and around us today. I believe that. We believe that, and we celebrate that together today. That's what our series is. We've launched into a series last week called Unexpected. And it's really just focusing in on like the goal of this series is to open our eyes and our hearts. Oh, to open our eyes and our hearts to the unexpected work God is doing in our life right now. Because we believe he is working. He's always at work in our hearts and in our lives and in the lives of those around us. And so will we be the one? Will we be the one, the kind of people, the kind of church that is expecting God to do the unexpected? Last week, we kicked off this series, and, and really the series is designed to launch us into Easter Sunday where we celebrate the resurrection, and we kicked it off with the unexpected nature of Jesus' arrival, and today we get to talk about the unexpected nature of Jesus' life. Why was Jesus so unexpected? What did he do? What did he say? It was so unexpected. Well, seemingly it was everything. Like everything he did and everything he said. I mean, if you look through the text, everything he did was amazing. We still marvel and wonder at his teachings still today. We're still looking back at the things he did and said, and we're still sometimes taken by surprise. And so that's what we're going to focus on today in this unexpected series. You know, there are things in life that are, are, are simply just unexpected. Like uh, going outside, getting ready for work, and you've got a flat tire, right? It kind of, you know, messes with your day a little bit, but that's just trivial. But there's those other things that are unexpected. The things that happen in our lives that, that leave us, like, speechless, or dumbfounded. Like we take a step back. It's like, there's a common phrase, I was beside myself, right? It was like an out-of-body experience. Hard to understand. Hard to explain. 
changed my life. It was like nothing I had ever seen before. When's the last time you had one of those moments? For me, um, you know, one of them was, was my wedding day. Like seeing my bride for the first time. I was just like speechless. Ah, the beauty. And like when all four of my kids were born, it changed the course of my life. Like they were born, I was holding my hands, I just I couldn't find words to describe the amount of love I was feeling for them. What are those moments for you? Those are the types of moments that Jesus had with people all the time, over and over again. And we see this in the, the gospel account of Mark. And if you, you can go ahead and turn with me there in Mark 2, 1 through 12. And when he uh, talks about the things that Jesus did and said with people, it's, it's like he, he really wants us to know as the readers that the people were astonished. They were amazed. It changed their life. It was like nothing they'd ever seen before. You know, I think, over, I think in our culture, in our English language, we sometimes overuse words. Like just the other day, I was eating a burrito, and I said, oh, this burrito is amazing. And I was thinking about this message, and I was like, you know, is it really amazing? Did it change my life? Was I dumbfounded and speechless? Was it like nothing I ever seen? It was a pretty good burrito, all right? But I wouldn't put it on that level. And so think through, like, this is what Mark means whenever we're going to see this word, like, that the crowds were amazed, that people were amazed. It was like, it's like nothing I ever seen before. It's that type of amazement and wonder that happened all the time around Jesus. So come with me in Mark 2, 1 through 12. I won't put the verses on the screen until we get to verse 8. So we'll read together Mark 2, verse 1. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. So if we were to back up and read through chapter 1, we would have already seen that Jesus had already begun his earthly, like his ministry, and he was already performing miracles. He was healing people. He was driving out demons. And, and it said like in chapter 1 that they were just amazed by how he spoke. Like it was like nothing they'd ever heard before. Just like the power and authority behind his speaking amazed them. And because of that, of course, the word spread quickly throughout the region. And like at this time already, people, crowds were coming to see this amazing thing happen. They were beginning to expect the unexpected to happen. And so verse 2, soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors, there was no more room even outside the door. I get this like uh, mental image when I read that of when I used to go to concerts in college you know we would line up for hours ahead of time outside the the venue door waiting for the doors to open and then like the doors would open and we'd rush in there and go all the way to the front and it was like standing room only you know and crowds would come in behind you and you're up against pinned up against the the guardrail and you can just feel the crowd like pressing in around you and that's that's kind of like the sense that I get here is like how excited people were. They were packing this house. There was no room for people even outside the door because they wanted to hear and see what Jesus was going to do and what he's going to say. And while he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus is what they wanted to do because of the crowd it was so packed they couldn't get him through so they dug a hole through the roof above his head now hold on all right so they show up and they're carrying a man on a mat i've got so many question marks like they okay they couldn't get through so they dug a hole in the roof like how did he get on the roof have you ever tried to carry like i have i have trouble just carrying my my 11 year old now you know but four guys carrying a paralyzed man up on top of the roof. So many question marks. And they began to dig a hole through the roof above Jesus' head. I wonder what the homeowner was thinking at that time. 
You know? Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. I wonder, like, did Jesus stop speaking? Did he stop teaching? I mean, at some point they would have heard this scratching around up there. You know, you can't just dismantle a roof without some debris following in. I mean, people were crowded in there. They probably would have heard the noise and seen him coming down. You know, did they just wait and stop and just let him come down? They're all looking at Jesus. What is he going to do? I mean, everything about the story is unexpected. It's so interesting. And Jesus does the unexpected. They lowered him right in front of Jesus and seeing The faith of the friends, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. Mm. If you're anything like me, doesn't that seem inverted? Isn't that unexpected? What were the friends expecting? Expecting him to be healed, right? But he said, my child, your sins are forgiven. I wonder if the homeowner was like, well, if you're not going to heal him, are you going to heal my roof? Or should I call the insurance company? But some of the teachers of religious law were sitting there. They thought to themselves, what is he saying? What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Hmm. Mind you, like, they had already been seeing this miraculous, the miraculous works of Jesus. They already heard word and testimony of people that have been healed, demons that have been cast out. They can hear the powerful, like, authority in his teaching. But the teachers are still dealing with doubt on who he is. And this is where I want to pick up on the screen in verse 8. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. And so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Why do you question this? And then he says, uh, asks a brilliant question. Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? What's beautiful about this question is that it, it, it It goes straight into their doubt, into their heart, because Jesus is reminding them both of these things are an act of God. Both of these things can only be done by the hand of God himself. And they're seeing the hand of God at work. They've seen it already. And Jesus bringing healing, but yet they question, oh, can he really forgive sin? What does he say? Is he really, you know, is he who he's claiming to be? This question gets right at the heart of their doubt. And Jesus says, so I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And then he turned directly to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. His actions validated his words. They validated his teaching. He is the Son of God. He says, I have the authority to both forgive sin." And bring healing. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. Imagine if you were there. If you would have seen this happen, wouldn't we all be stunned? They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. We've never seen anything like this before. They were amazed and astonished by what Jesus said and what he did. I think what's beautiful about this passage of Scripture, I mean, there's so much in there. It's hard to unpack everything that's, that's happening here. But one thing that I think he would remind us today is, ultimately, Jesus is equating the miraculous nature of someone being physically healed like that to the miraculous nature of being forgiven of your sins by God Almighty. Do you realize that you're sitting next to living, breathing examples of God's miraculous power at work right here today? Or have we lost the sense of awe and wonder that we get to come to God and be forgiven? 
forgiven by God himself because of what he's done for us through Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying, that is what I am most deeply concerned about. Because if I heal someone temporarily, you know what? Anybody that Jesus has ever healed has eventually walked through the doors of death again. And so what he's ultimately concerned about is the eternal. We often focus on the temporal, but Jesus is focused in on the eternal. What he wants to do for every single one of us is to provide eternal healing, a healing that lasts forever so that we can be reunited with God for eternity. That's what he desires. But he also cares about the temporary and he invites us to bring those things to him. It's beautiful. But I think he would open up our eyes today to help us see things, God, the way that you see him. Help us to see the eternal in the midst of our temporal. But they were amazed by what he said and what he did. And this story, and like the one in chapter 1 that we didn't get to read, it just serves as like a template for, for everything Jesus did. They were constantly amazed by what Jesus said and what he did. Here's some of the other passages just in the Gospel of Mark alone, where Mark takes time to write about the response of the people and how they were just amazed and stunned at the things he did. Like in 542, he, he heals a 12-year-old girl who had died. He brings her back to life. And they were amazed. And in 651, he's, he's walking on water. And by the power and authority of his word, because he's the one who spoke everything to, into existence, he was able to say, calm, be still. And everything was still and it stunned his disciples. They were amazed by this Jesus. And in 737, now oh, this, this one is interesting. It was unexpected what Jesus did. Uh, he healed a, a deaf and blind man by putting his fingers in his ears and spitting on his hand and put it in, in the guy's mouth. And he said, be opened. And instantly the man could hear perfectly and his tongue was freed so he could speak plainly. And Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone, but the more he told them not to, the more they spread the news. They were completely amazed and said again and again, everything he does is so wonderful. He even makes the deaf to hear and gives speech to those who cannot speak. Everywhere he went, people were amazed by his teaching. They're amazed by what he did. They're amazed by what he said. They're amazed by what he did. That's what it says over and over again. These are just the texts where the author takes time to describe the reaction of the crowd. But it's kind of inferred that like everywhere he did, everything he did was amazing. So much so that like you read uh, passages like this at Mark 145, that as a result of what he was doing and saying, large crowds surrounded Jesus and he couldn't publicly enter a town anywhere. He had to stay out in the secluded places. But people from everywhere still found him. And they kept coming to him. And that's before they even had GPS. Tracking his phone. Wherever he went, in villages, cities, or the countryside, they brought the sick out to the marketplaces. They begged him, Jesus, oh, let the sick just touch at least the fringe of your robe. And, and all who touched him were healed. Jesus did amazing things and it still amazes us today as we look back but we're going to jump into a different section of scripture it's in Mark 6 if you'd open your Bibles to Mark 6 and we're going to see we're going to look at two different scriptures stories where it's not so much the people around Jesus that were amazed, but we get to see what Jesus was amazed at. What, what amazed Jesus? And I'll just skip right to the end. In 6.6, 6, he was amazed at their unbelief. Let's back up into 6.1. So here's the beginning of the story. Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth. Nazareth was his hometown. 
This is where he grew up. This is where he spent his life as a carpenter. And the next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? But then something happened. Something shifted in the culture. And then they scoffed. Said, he's just, a, he's just the carpenter. The son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and, and Simon. We know those guys. I mean, his sisters, they live right here among us. They were deeply offended, and that says they refused to believe in him. They re- it was like a rejection of the truth. They refused to believe it. They saw the evidence all around him. They saw his mighty works. They were dumbfounded by his teaching, by his wisdom. But then it switched. They're like, oh, wait, no, we know who this is. He's just a carpenter. And they've refused to believe. They rejected him. Then Jesus said, A prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his own relatives and his own family. You know, I think this might serve for, for some of us as, as sort of a, maybe a warning or a caution or maybe a helpful way to, to pray or to grow. And that I think it's, it can become easy for Jesus and the stories about Jesus. And maybe you're here today and you've heard these stories a thousand times. It can become easy to become sort of like the people of Nazareth where Jesus has just become too familiar in your life. You know about him. You know what he did, what he said, but you don't really know him. That's a danger for all of us to fall into. We should never trade what we know about Jesus for what he really wants for us, to know him deeply and personally. Because it's in that knowing him deeply and personally, it's coming to him in faith that, like, that's when he does the unexpected. So the encouragement today is, like, are you still, are you still amazed by what Jesus has done for you? Are you still amazed? Ah, oh, this beautiful gift of grace he's given you. This miraculous gift of forgiveness. That is God at work right here and now. Now we get to witness it here now today. Are you still amazed by him? If if not, why not? Hmm. And it says, and because of their unbelief. He couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Well, that's pretty cool, right? That's good. At least there was that. But man, he couldn't do many miracles like he was doing everywhere else. Why? Like, did their unbelief limit his power in any way? No, their unbelief does not limit his power. He's still the mighty God. Nothing affects him like that. But the difference is everywhere else he went, People were coming to him. They were dropping their friends down through the roof saying, God, we need you. We need your help. And you're the only one that can provide it. They were coming to him. And in that coming to him in relationship and faith and faithfulness, that's when God works and that's when he heals because God is a gentle and kind God. He doesn't force anyone to follow him. He doesn't force us to believe in him. He invites us to come to him in faith and accept his forgiveness, accept his healing. He wasn't able to do that with them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Oh, may I never be a person. May we never be a people. May we never be a church that Jesus is amazed at because of our unbelief. Hmm. So that leads us to this question for us to consider, where is our unbelief? What are those things we're refusing to believe about Jesus? We're going to come back to that question in a minute. But first, I want to go into a different text. Now, Mark 
6, the one we just read, was the only passage in Mark where it speaks of Jesus being amazed. But there is one other story, and it's found in Matthew 8. And it serves as kind of like the antithesis of this first story. And it's full of hope for us today. It's in Matthew 8, 5, 13. And it says, Jesus is amazed. Matthew 8, 5. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer came and pleaded with him. Now, this Roman officer would have been someone outside. Like, he would have been considered an outsider. He actually worked for the government that was actually uh, oppressing the Jewish nation, the Jewish people. So he would have been considered an outsider amongst uh, many of the people that were following Jesus around. But he came and he pleaded with him, Lord, my young servant lies in bed, paralyzed and in terrible pain. And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. I love that. But the officer said, Lord, I am not worthy. I'm not worthy to have you even come into my home. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. (laughs) I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers, and I only need to say go, and they go, or come, and they come, and and if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. What, is, he, what he's saying to Jesus right now is, I believe that you have the authority over life and death. I believe that you are who you say you are. That you can heal anyone. And so therefore, you don't even need to be in my presence. You can just say the word and it'll happen. Man, that is incredible faith. And Jesus says, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Oh, to be the kind of people that Jesus is amazed at because of our faith, not because of our unbelief. And turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. And I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast in the kingdom of heaven. What Jesus is saying right here in in front of everyone is that I'm about to blow the doors wide open to God's kingdom, and I'm going to let anyone come in. The Gentiles, as far as the east is from the west, are welcome to sit and feast with me in the kingdom of God. That is amazing news. He's talking about you and me, right? Amen. That's why he came. Oh, that's beautiful. But many Israelites, those for whom the kingdom was prepared, will be thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus, he turned to the Roman officer. He said, go back home because you believed that it has happened. And the young servant was healed that same hour. The question for us again is, where is your unbelief? What are the things that are broken in your life? Where do you need healing in your heart, your soul, or even physically that you haven't been able to experience his healing just simply because you haven't brought it to him? What do you need to bring to Jesus out of faith, trusting and knowing That he is still the same God today. He's still the same Jesus today as he was yesterday. As he was 2,000 years ago. Still offering for us to come to him. That's the story of our brother David that we got to see the video of. He had that faith and he came to Jesus. And Jesus still does the amazingly unexpected today. Just as he did then. Hmm. What do you need to bring to Jesus? I want to go to one other uh, scripture. It's in John 14. It will be on the screen, but I love just opening up the text. So if you want to go to John 14. Um, Man, it was hard. Like today's message is diving into the unexpected nature of Jesus' life. And 
it was really hard to pick, like, where do we land? I mean, everything he did was unexpected and amazing, and so we just needed to narrow it down to a few ideas, and I think this text, this, these words of Jesus in John 14 will help us to kind of, to, to take it somewhere. Like, wh- what do we do with this? If we're called to this faith in him, knowing that he still does today what he did then, he's inviting us into relationship with him, uh, this text might help us go to a next step. It's in John 14, verse 12, and he says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. Ah, I feel like we need to read that again. Over and over again, I tell you the truth. This is Jesus. The son of the living God, our Lord and Savior, he's telling us the truth about something. Anyone, that's you and us, who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. Are we living like we believe that's true? If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now. That's Jesus. Jesus is God's presence on the earth right right now physically with them. And then later, he will be in you. That's his design. Later, Jesus said, it's better that I go because then the Holy Spirit will come It's like Jesus is saying when he was on earth physically, he could only be at one place at one time. But when I leave, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and he's going to be in every single one of you. And his spirit through you is going to be the conduit by which we light up the entire planet with his love, with the light of the gospel. That's the way he's designed it. Are we living and believing that? Are we living like that's true? Because that's what he's called us to. That is the truth. He said, I tell you the truth you will do even greater things than I have done. Oh, I want to see it. Let's do it. Mm. And so that leads us to this amazing invitation. It was unexpected that any one of us in this room would be able to enter into the kingdom of God, but that's why Jesus came. He came for all who want to to enter in the kingdom of God, to walk through those doors and receive his grace and mercy and love and forgiveness and the gift of his Holy Spirit. It's been an invitation from Jesus to receive the unexpected. Receive the unexpected in your life. And that's not just a one-time thing. It's an ongoing thing as you grow in relationship with him to continue to receive uh, the blessing of his forgiveness and the blessing of his transformation. And as you abide with Jesus and walk with him by his Holy Spirit, we begin to expect the unexpected just, just, just like Jesus said it would happen. To always expect him to be at work in your life and in the lives of those around you. He has a plan for you. He wants you to be the conduit of his love and his gospel to the the people around you, using the specific gifts that he's given each and every individual to just be the church, the body of Christ, living in completion together as we grow together in him. And then to share the unexpected. We are called to share this gift we've been given. This unexpected gift we've been given, to share it with those around us. So maybe you're here today and you're like, man, that sounds really good. Like, I I want to have that kind of faith, but I just don't know how. I just want to make it really practical and really simple for every single one of us. Something we can do today. Something that all of us need to do every day, regardless of of where we are on on our journey of faith with Jesus. It's devote time to him in his scripture. That's where he's going to shape us and mold us. And we're going to devote time to him in prayer, coming to him with all of who we are and allowing him to speak to us through prayer and scripture in the context of community. Guys, if, if the only way you're interacting with God is by attending Sunday service, we are so glad that you're here. That's a great starting point. But if that's the only thing you're doing, you are missing out 
on this amazing gift and opportunity of what God wants to do in you, through you, through, through the context of a smaller community. When you're striving to like grow in your faith together and learning what God is doing individually in a personal level with, with those around you, that could look like a thousand different things. It could look like you just meeting some guys up for coffee once a week. Be joining a life group. It's, it's whatever it is, but pray about how God wants to use you in community here. Consider devoting your time to Jesus in this way. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> oh, Lord God, you are the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We believe we come to you in faith, believing that your word is true. But on the other hand, God, we, we confess that we often lack faith. We often lose sight of who you are. We lose sight of who you've called us to be. So God, help us there. Pray that you speak to us right now as we as we reflect on your truth and bring it to you in prayer and in worship and thanksgiving and communion together. I pray that you would reveal to us that which by your mercy and grace you want to reveal to us today. God, we want to hear from you. We want to know where we are blind. We want to know where we we want to know the things that you want us to bring to you, God. Thank you so much for your gift of grace. Thank you that we get to be your children. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to take some time now as a church community to sit with the Lord in prayer and to ask him to reveal to us where it is that our unbelief lies. And so during this time, maybe a, a helpful question or prompt for you to take to him might be this. What have I neglected or refused to bring to the Lord? Whether that be a wound from your past, maybe a shameful part of your story, maybe a broken relationship that you think will never be restored, whatever it is, where does your unbelief lie? I invite you now to, to close your eyes. I want you to take your hands and lay them palms facing up in your lap and then close your hands into fists. Now this may be new or an uncomfortable practice for you, but there's something beautiful and I believe helpful when we align our bodies and our minds and our hearts in prayer to the Lord. So this physical act of closing our fists, it helps remind us that there are things that we are holding on to that we have yet to bring to the Lord because of our unbelief. So during this time of prayer, simply go to the Lord and ask him to speak to you, to reveal to you what it is that you have yet to bring to him because of your unbelief. Let's go to him now.
Jesus and only Jesus is able to take the broken pieces of your life and restore you to wholeness. So confess, confess your need for him. Confess to him your unbelief and repent by taking those things, bringing them to him and laying them down at his feet, trusting in him. As we do this, as we confess and repent, I want you to open your hands. A physical reminder that you are no longer bound by your unbelief. That you are ready to receive with unburdened hands the grace that he has freely given to you by way of the cross and the resurrection. Trusting in the transformation that he will provide by the work of his spirit. Let's confess, repent, and receive from him together now. you to stand with us if you're able as we continue to pray now through song asking the Lord to change us like only he can to make us to become more like his son Jesus you came to the world you created trading your crown for a cross you really Died, the innocent life paid the cost. Counting your status as nothing, the King of all kings came to serve, washing my feet, covering me with your love. Let this be our prayer. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. in my treasure You're the one that I can't live without So here at your feet my desires and dreams I lay down Oh Here at your feet my desires and dreams I lay down We lay them down If more Shake. 
We're moving into a time of communion, so you can go ahead and get out the elements and just hold them in your hands. You know, just a few minutes ago, we took some time to examine ourselves and to confess the areas of unbelief in our life. And that's really just been preparing us for this time of communion to receive from the Lord. Just a moment ago, we held our fists tightly, representing us holding on to our sin and our shame. And now we receive and we hold in our hands the body and the blood of Jesus freely given for you. The source of your forgiveness and love and redemption. So as we take a few moments to think about what Jesus has done for us, may he increase your awe and wonder. And may you simply receive his undeserving and unexpected grace in your life. Let's take some time and have communion together. for all he's done in our lives.
cross still stands, the blood still flows, the work is finished, and hell still knows that the grave is still empty, the stone is still this morning let's listen to this message from Hebrews 10 it says and so dear brothers and sisters we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus and since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts fully trusting him let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. I pray, my friends, that as we go about this week, our faith in Christ will be evident in how we live. It's always a joy to spend time together with you. We hope you have a great week, and we'll see you soon.